And next, ladies and gentlemen, software defined radio. Um, because uh, Matthew Knight he is a software and hardware engineer at Bastille, uh, which was founded in 2014, and they're the leader in enterprise threat detection through software defined radio. And he's going to talk about the practical signal decomposition via software defined radio. So they're going to grab package from the air once you communicate. So let's give him a big hand. Matthew Knight. <laughs> Imagine I was going to put it, his stuff and he needs some time for that, plug in his laptop. Um, let, me, let me tell you about software defined radio. Uh, at hackers' conferences, this is your, well, you need to have in your hacker toolkit, of course. And I saw two applications which were quite remarkable. Uh, one was quite serious, that, that they developed the Salamandra for uh, that's right, that's right. activists. So if they are in contact with police or intelligence services and they suspect that bugs are around, then with the Salamandra they can spot whether, where the bugs are located and they can pick them off. Uh, another application was quite funny indeed. Uh, I don't know if any, anyone is in marine, but you have the marine identification system. It's a very old system from the 1994, 1984. Uh, so it's just a radio signal coming from from your boat saying, well, I'm a boat of this size and this is the owner and I travel this speed and I'm over there, you know, something like that. Being a very old system, they only rely on licenses, so they think that only people pay for it, use it. Well, with software-defined radio, you can spoof it. So once at a hacker conference, there was this guy who had a small boat, uh, was uh, well near the area here uh, on the small lake, he was just sailing away, but he spoofed the signal of a big aircraft car carrier coming from the US. <laughs> so imagine the Harbor Authority, they were watching their screens and all these boats displaying their identity and they would see an American aircraft carrier in the lake going at 100 knots. <laughs> and he also sailed the, the, the signs of the hacker camp he was at. Shall I quit? You're you ready? Oh, you're, you're, you're doing great. Keep going if you want. Okay, well, one question. But, I, but I'm ready too. Oh, you're so. ready? To, okay. Uh, who has a software defined radio of their own? Yeah, some folks over there. Okay, enjoy. Jonathan Knight. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Matthew Knight. Thanks, Chris, for the intro. Um, my name is Matt Knight. I'm a software engineer and security researcher with Bastille Networks. Uh, I have a background in electrical engineering, got a BA from Dartmouth a couple years ago. Um, and what I spend most of my time on these days is um, uh, applied security research on wireless systems. And uh, I use Software Defined Radio as my primary tool for doing this. And I'm here today to share uh, s some applications of SDR, both in security, but also in some other related fields too. Um, so, you know, I obviously apply SDR to security related problems. However, my first involvement with the technology was actually. Uh, to support the development of uh, a Z-Wave networking stack. I was writing kind of conventional embedded firmware and wanted some better insight into what was happening in the RF spectrum. Uh, so I borrowed a friend of mine's um, uh, HackerF Jawbreaker, which is the predecessor to the HackerF1, and, uh, and was using that just as like a basic spectrum, spectrum analyzer. Uh, but it wasn't until I actually got my hands on it that I realized that the implications of SDR go far beyond um, you know, simple monitoring uh, scenarios like that. And they actually have uh, really dire and drastic implications for uh, security as well. So if you're not familiar with it, um, software-defined radio is essentially an architecture uh, where rather than using a, uh, a radio chip that does one protocol very well, you instead essentially split that in two. So you use a radio chip that can capture a, uh, flexibly capture a wide bandwidth of raw RF information, and then you shuttle that back to a conventional host whether it's a, um, a you know, traditional architecture like an x86 computer or an FPGA. Um, and what this does is it allows you to, uh, to implement arbitrary physical layers in software. Uh, so that lets you uh, iterate um, very rapidly and develop radio protocols at the speed that you, same speed that you develop software. So I'm going to briefly walk through um, the evolution of the, uh, the radio landscape in the last, uh, uh, last couple of years. Uh, I'm going to go over, you know, touch on some concepts as we go. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to walk you through um, the, uh, the, the workflow and the methodology that I apply um, when I reverse engineer wireless signals. Um, I'll note that I applied this to the LoRa physical layer um, two years ago, and I published my findings there at um, CCC. Uh, I'm going to be talking kind of peripherally about some related topics there, but um, this isn't going to be purely about the LoRa physical layer. Um, if you want to go look that up, that video is out there. So um, this is going to be a, a complimentary talk to that. 
All right, so um, briefly going to run through the evolution of um, kind of network security technology and, uh, and talk about why I think this is significant um, and how it ties into the wireless space. So in the 1990s, if you wanted to uh, you know, inspect your networks and see what type of traffic was traveling over them, uh, you really had two protocols that you were concerned with. You had um, Ethernet and Token Ring were, um, were two, of the big, um, two, two of the big enterprise um, uh, protocols that you'd want to uh, inspect. And uh, if you wanted to get deeper insight into what was happening on those protocols, uh, you would use a device um, like this. You're, um, uh, you'd buy an expensive uh, uh, computer like this one, and you'd run uh, the Network General Packet Sniffer software on it, which was one of the first um, packet inspection, um, inspection tools. Obviously, that's expensive and proprietary. Uh, that's not great. Fast forward to 1998, and uh, Wireshark came out. It was called Ethereal at the time. It's since rebranded. Um, uh, that's open source and free, and when you combine that with monitor mode NICs, uh, we now have commodity packet sniffers that um, anybody can, can use and then extend to suit their purposes. Now, if we look at some trends in the, in the networking uh, space since the 2000s, um, remember the map of protocols in the 90s when we just had Ethernet and Token Ring? Uh, it's a little more complicated now. Um, Ethernet and Token Ring are still there. You know, Ethernet's still all over the place, and I'm sure you can find a Token Ring deployment if you, if you look hard enough. Um, but then we have all these other standards that have, that have blown up too. And uh, you'll, you'll notice that tons of these are wireless. Um, and I'll note that LoRa is up there too. It's, it's, it's hidden in there too. But tons of these protocols are wireless. So uh, in the 2000s, if you wanted to get, get uh, insight into what was happening on any of these, um, you could either use a commodity radio, but if you wanted to look at the physical layer, you would have to use an early software-defined radio. And uh, you know, these were very expensive, six figures. Um, they were hard to use, um, a lot of proprietary tool chains and things like that. But because of this proprietary uh, lock-in and cost, it mostly restricted it to, um, to academic and um, uh, government you know, applications. Fast forward to 2012, and something really interesting happened. Um, there was a, a hacker who was looking at his uh, digital TV, um, uh, uh, DVB-T uh, USB dongle, which is a little device you plug into your computer and you can uh, decode terrestrial video downlink broadcasts. Uh, he was looking at that and found a hidden register where if you set it to a certain value, uh, that radio would bypass the demodulator and the decoder and send raw spectrum information over USB back to your host. So that was pretty interesting. He, uh, he built that out, and, and this is now what we know as the RTL-SDR, um, which is many people's first, uh, first entree into the software-defined radio field. So for, for you know, $8 or $20 or you know, some nominal amount of money, you can get a device that will allow you to start exploring the spectrum. Uh, it's 2018. There are tons of SDRs and all sorts of different price points. Um, it's totally commodity. Um, the, this, it's a really exciting time to be getting into the space. At the same time, uh, we now know that 802.11 um, is really just a piece of the puzzle here. Uh, it's, a, it's just a piece of the, 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 wire, of, of the wireless standards, um, state of wireless standards. Uh, we have now a physical layer for every use case. And with the growth of mobile and IoT, we have um, you know, tons of different proprietary networks that are connecting um, embedded systems to the internet um, in more, more new ways. Now, the fact that, um, the fact that you know, IoT is, is connecting these embedded systems has some pretty interesting implications. Uh, when you consider that embedded systems are really designed around, the, around compromise, um, oftentimes uh, you're limited with the type of uh, encryption you can support, uh, whether or not you can deploy over-the-air software updates to them, for instance. And often, you know, because they're running on battery in many scenarios, that limits the type of computation you can do on them. Uh, and uh, to, to illustrate you know, why I think embedded systems are particularly uh, uh, challenging, I want to draw your attention to the picture on the left there, where um, you know, in frame, but not visible to, to you, the audience, are three literal embedded systems. Uh, they're, they're traffic light sensors that are buried in concrete. They're embedded in concrete. So you can imagine that getting software to those is quite a bit more complicated than installing your Microsoft um, you know, Patch Tuesday update. Um, when you combine this with the fact that um, you know, industries have historically relied on security to obscure, obsc or obscurity to protect their, um, these embedded systems, uh, it's very easy for attackers who are looking for, for targets to knock over. And we can apply the same uh, reasoning to the wireless space as well. Because the physical layer has been obscure, we haven't had tools to look at um, wireless physical layers. Um, they are, uh, it's, it's pretty easy to have findings here when you start to look at them. 
So say you want to start hacking a wireless physical layer. Um, what does it take to, to get into this? Well, as we've covered, uh, now sniffing IP networks is very easy. Um, interfacing with IP networks is, is pretty trivial because we have uh, mature monitor mode NICs that speak the protocols. Um, so for 802.3, um, you know, Ethernet, that's you know, any, any, uh, basically any, any NIC will be able to provide data to Wireshark. And uh, most 802.11 cards you can put in a monitor mode and, and use to you know, arbitrarily sniff networks. Um, however, uh, sniffing non-802.11 wireless networks is still very challenging. And that's because the interface is non-trivial. Uh, so instead, we want to be able to find a way to implement arbitrary, uh, arbitrary protocols at layer one um, so that we can start uh, exposing this data and exposing uh, various behaviors in the physical layer. So that's where software-defined radio comes into play. And uh, there are a number of things that software-defined radio makes, uh, makes easy, both in security, but, but also beyond security as well. Uh, one of the most common applications of software-defined radio is for proto prototyping uh, large, complicated, uh, integrated designs. Um, so as I mentioned, one of the things that SDR does for us is it enables to iterate over, um, over radio protocols um, at, at the speed of software. Because you're not you know, design, making your design, testing it, and then sending it to China and having them put it on a die, uh, oftentimes you can put parts of that process onto an FPGA and test it in a, in a much faster iteration. Um, so this, uh, this has really changed the way that um, companies uh, simulate and test their designs before they go and shrink them down to an IC. Um, and uh, just as an example of that, on the right, I have um, the RTL hierarchy for an AO215 forward decoder that I wrote, wrote about a year ago. Um, so the fact that you can do this all in VHDL and then drop it onto an FPGA and, uh, and get feedback immediately on it is, is really nice. Um, obviously, there are security implications here, too. Um, in the sense that um, SDR now exposes the physical layer to attack and abuse in ways that the protocol designers didn't necessarily consider. Um, I actually gave a talk on this with my, uh, my colleague Mark Newland at DEF CON this past year, um, where we talk about some offensive applications of software-defined radio and, um, and, and you know, physical layer technologies. So if you're interested in that, I'd encourage you to go check out the video. Um, another uh, use for SDR is in surveying. Um, as I mentioned with my anecdote about uh, using SDR to, while well, I was developing the Z-Wave networking stack, um, an SDR is, uh, doubles as a, a poor man's spectrum analyzer. The fact that you can look at you know, some amount of bandwidth of spectrum and visually see what's happening there means that if you're, if you're in a contested environment and you want to get your uh, application working better, you can look at the spectrum and maybe find a channel that's not in use or find other ways of, of deconflicting that. And here we have a spectrogram which is just a visual representation of what's happening in the, in, in the spectrum. We have time in the y-axis, frequency in the x-axis, and then the power of, of the signals that are present um, is the, the color, you know, the z-axis, the intensity there. Um, one last uh, application of SDR is for optimization. Um, because we can iterate, uh, SDR is a very natural platform for um, doing rapid experimentation uh, across a number of different physical layer technologies. And you can either do this um, you know, in simulation using a tool like a new radio, or you can do it, um, you can actually push it out uh, into hardware and test it um, you know, in real situations as well. Uh, combine this with the fact that there's a vibrant and, and really booming open source ecosystem, and SDR is a really uh, compelling tool for a number of different applications. Um, I just mentioned GNU Radio earlier. Uh, GNU Radio is an um, open source and modular um, digital signal processing framework. And it basically, uh, kind of abstracts and hides all the really nasty math that has to be done in order for, for radios to work. So what you can do is you can you know, drag and drop blocks, such as your, your um, software-defined radio driver, um, and, uh, and things like filters, resamplers, uh, what have you. You just can drag them around and drop them onto flow graphs, and, uh, and, and, um, and some people smarter than me have written code uh, that makes all this, all this really easy. Um, and uh, one thing I want to plug is um, uh, two, there are two, two giants in the space, um, Mike Osman and Balin Sieber, um, have done a lot of work on, on recording their knowledge and trying to democratize it and push it out. So, um, for instance, Mike Osman has a, uh, like a 10 or 11 part video series where he talks about all the math that goes in SDR. Um, that is a really great place to start. If you want to go there and watch those videos, he'll really start from from first principles and work through to actually demodulating signals. Uh, additionally, um, my colleague Balin Sieber has made a, uh, 
um, a series of YouTube videos that are much more applied to GNU Radio. Uh, so if you want to you know, take those first principles that you learned from Mike and figure out how to do useful things with them in GNU Radio, you can watch Balance videos. Um, and they're, they're very technical, but it's a good place to start. So I want to briefly talk through um, what happens when we actually tell a radio to transmit. Because um, you know, I imagine you know, most of us here at the Things Network conference, it's primarily a LoRaWAN-focused event, um, we're used to working at you know, layer two and up, where you're dealing with bits and software. Um, but you know, radios, uh, once you get down to a certain point, you're not dealing with bits anymore. You're dealing with electrons and, and, and you know, voltage and wi wiring and timing information, the physical layer phenomena. So I think it's important to, um, to understand how that, that transition works. So you know, at some point, you know, you're writing your software and you have you know, a Mac frame composed and you want to transmit that. So you call um, you know, your LoRa driver.send and you pass in a buffer and, uh, and you make that API call and your uh, Mac frame gets written out to the radio over some kind of interface, whether it's you know, I2C or SPI or, uh, or UART or whatever. Uh, that uh, Mac frame uh, gets passed up to the radio, and then the radio is going to uh, append and prepend some information to it. So it's going to append a, a preamble, a sort of frame delimiter, and a header, and then it's going to um, uh, append a CRC. Uh, that then gets run through a function called the modulation. Uh, and the modulation is a, essentially a math function that's going to take your physical layer frame, it's going to map it into, or it's going to map your ones and zeros into the electrical phenomena that, com that compose, com comprise the phi. And when it does that, you go from having discreetly sampled digital information into having uh, analog information, continuous, continuous time. So that's when you get your waveform. And then you push that off out to your RF front end, your antenna, whatnot, and, um, and the, there's a great talk on antenna design yesterday. Um, I don't understand any, any of that, but uh, it goes off into the front end and then goes off into the air and um, goes off to your receiver. So receiving is quite a bit more complicated, and that's what the rest of this talk is going to cover. Um, and the reason why it's more complicated is because we have to deal with um, issues of synchronization and state. Um, whereas your transmitter, um, you know, you can basically comprise a buffer, uh, and then it just pushes it out and it goes. The receiver has to be aware of when it's receiving a packet so that it can figure out when to sample. So to do that, we put together a state machine. Um, so the receive, uh, physical layer receiver is going to have a state machine uh, that's going to be implementing a process kind of like this, and we're going to talk through these, these steps um, you know, momentarily. But essentially, once it detects a certain state and reads out a certain number of symbols, it's going to uh, present that to layer two, and then your software can take it from there. But the key concepts to take away from this and to be mindful of as we continue through the rest of this talk is that radios are state machines, and they behave deterministically. However, um, the inputs to these state machines, because we're dealing with, um, with the RF spectrum in the radio space, um, are, are very complicated. Um, we have tons of contention, especially being in the ISM band with LoRa, um, that, that oftentimes the inputs can get these state machines to do odd and unexpected things. Um, so we can, we can do things like fingerprint these and, and, and study them and, and figure out how they work, both to, uh, to better understand their, their traditional conventional operation uh, as developers, but also to understand the ways in which they fail as attackers. So that brings us to um, my wireless reverse engineering methodology. And this is the process that I apply to um, wireless protocols as I'm trying to go from a physical layer up to bits. And I'm going to begin this with a brief interactive uh, um, portion if, if the demo gods cooperate here. Um, so I have over here a virtual machine. Reveal the entropy of my password real quick. And then right now I'm just running a spectrogram in baud line. So I've got a USRP here on the table that's collecting the 868 megahertz band. And right away we can start to see some lower traffic. Can you all see this okay? So I'm going to wait until we see a good one. Uh, Let's see. That looked good. And we're going to zoom in on this, this signal here. And we're just going to play a little game. Uh, I'm going to ask you to take a look at this signal and just yell out, what do you see? Yeah, so, so I, I heard chirps. That's right. So we, we see um, you know, the, the very distinctive um, uh, chirp signal that is, that is what Laura's is built on. Um, what else do you see? Preamble. Very good. So we see a preamble. 
Um, the preamble in this case, uh, you'll note that the first, you know, portion of the, uh, of the signal, uh, the first, you know, bit that we can see, um, all the chirps are going in the same direction, and, uh, and they're happening in a, in a consistent and periodic way. Uh, what happens after the preamble? That's right, so we have a synchronization element. And in LoRa, we can see that uh, the chirp direction changes, uh, and that represents our sort of frame delimiter. And then beyond that, you can see that the chirps get quite a bit, um, you know, quite a, get quite a bit choppier, and that rep represents our actual data that's modulated onto the chirp. Um, how about um, how about the um, the signal itself? Does it reside at um, does it reside more or less around the same frequency? Is it rapidly changing frequencies, or you see anything about that? So th that's right. The signal is moving back and forth, um, but I will point out it's happening within the same band, right? So we can start to um, you know, come up with this notion of, uh, of a channel as well. So, um, so we've identified some information about the, the preamble and the structure of the physical layer. Um, we've established the notion of there being um, a channel. And uh, we've also identified some features of the modulation as well. So I'll jump back over to my slides here. And we can start t uh, talking through this methodology. This is my, uh, my fallback in case the, uh, the SDR didn't cooperate. Um, so as we walk through this methodology, I just want to point out that the part that we're going to be um, really putting structure around is this physical error state machine. So the demodulator up through, um, up through the state machine that, um, that turns that into, into bits. So step one here is to characterize the channel. And um, there are really three things that we're looking to identify in doing this. Um, the first is um, where on the spectrum does the signal live, um, i.e. what is its center frequency? And the second is, how wide is the channel? Uh, and typically, this is measured in kilohertz or megahertz. And um, in LoRaWAN, um, we have um, 125, 250, and 500 kilohertz wide channels, which are, are reasonably wide for ISM protocols. And the third thing is, we want to identify whether the channel is static or if it hops. Um, so uh, LoRaWAN, I believe, typically uses static channels, but um, protocols like you know, Bluetooth and Bluetooth Low Energy, they, they hop quite a bit. So um, you know, an individual packet will exist within a single channel, but, um, but a device will actually use multiple channels in communicating. Uh, the second thing we do here is identify the modulation. And the modulation, again, is the function that defines how your data gets mapped into RF energy, how your, your ones and zeros get mapped into the analog physical phenomena um, that comprise the phi. Um, now, common modulations uh, use um, FSK, like lots of you know, low power, low complexity IoT devices use frequency shift keying. Um, but also, we see a lot of OFDM these days, which is um, you know, the core technology that LTE and um, cellular uh, technologies are built on. Um, LoRa uses something that's quite different, which is why I got excited to work on it initially, um, which is this, um, this you know, you know, continuous you know, frequency modulation built on chirps. Um, now, uh, you know, there are a couple different ways you can identify a modulation. Um, the easiest way is to lean on open source intelligence and documentation. You can look at things like the FCC test report, and oftentimes that will contain the modulation. If, if you have access to a data sheet, that's a good source too. Um, but the second way that's really useful is to use your intuition. And that's something that you'll develop as you reverse engineer more signals. You'll be able to look at a spectrogram and say, that looks like this. But until you have that, you can, you can lean on open source info. Uh, the next step is to identify the symbol rate. Uh, and that is um, how often the symbol state changes. And what that's going to inform you is it's raining. Uh, <laughs> uh, what, that's going, what that's going to, uh, to do is tell you um, how fast you need to sample and, and how regularly you need to sample in order to extract the symbols from the modulation. Um, uh, so there are two ways we can uh, identify, it, identify this. Again, we can use open source intelligence and documentation. We can also measure it empirically. Um, and uh, you can use the tool Bodline that I showed you earlier. But you can also use this other tool that's um, new called Inspectrum, which has some features that makes this really easy. Um, also, Inspectrum is open source, Bodline is not, um, just to, to plug it. But it has this uh, uh, cursors feature, which you can actually use to visually align, um, align the cursors with, um, uh, with your spectrum, and then you can extract the, extract the information that way. Uh, the fourth, fourth step here is to synchronize on the preamble and start a frame delimiter. And uh, we'll use LoRa again as an example here. Um, we pointed out in the, in the interactive section earlier um, the, all of these elements here. We have the preamble, the start of frame delimiter, and then the data. 
um, the lower physical layer actually has another element called the, uh, the sync word, which is in between the preamble and the SFD. Um, but essentially, when you write your state machine, uh, you're going to uh, design your states so that you initially you begin looking for the preamble. So you're just looking for uh, wh whether that's the continuous up chirp, um, recognizing that. If it's FSK, oftentimes you'll have your signal alternating between two different frequencies, and you just look for that to happen a few times, and then once you hit that state, you advance to the next state where you look for your start of frame delimiter. And that's, the SFD is really what you use for synchronization. So once that lands, you can align your receiver with the transmitter and start sampling out your symbols. Uh, and that brings us to step five, um, which is to decode and extract um, uh, the symbols. And uh, uh, so we're converting the symbols, in doing this, we're converting the symbols to bits. Um, and then at this point, we have bits on a disk. So uh, if there's any encoding or any um, you know, error correction or things like that that were applied to the signal before it was transmitted, uh, we're now able to iterate over these as if it was any other binary format. Um, so you know, we can construct, construct and work through this as if it were any other type of black box analysis. So we can control the inputs on, on the side of the transmitter, um, measure the outputs, and then by stepping through um, through known sets of inputs, we can observe how the outputs change and make inferences and conclusions around that. And if you want to learn more about this process, um, I would encourage you to watch my um, 33C3 talk um, that I gave on the Laura physical layer um, a little over a year ago. Um, the hardest part of that whole, whole, um, whole exercise was working through this, was working through the encoding. Um, so you can see um, you know, some of the methods in action there. Um, and that's really it. So there are five steps um, that, that, that I'd say 90% of um, contemporary digital modulations can be worked through, or digital you know, commu wireless communications architectures can be worked through um, by using this process. Uh, to learn more, um, uh, to learn more um, I have some resources that I'd like to, like to direct you to. Um, I gave a, a, a lecture series called So You Wanna Hack Radios with my colleague Mark um, uh, over the past year. And that is this methodology applied to a range of different wireless devices. Um, so you can actually um, see this applied you know, in, you know, against real, uh, real IoT devices rather than just hearing me talking about it. Um, I already plugged uh, my, my LoRa talk from CCC that has um, lots of information about the symbol decoding. Uh, and then finally, the um, talk I gave at DEF CON, Radio Exploitation 101, is kind of the step beyond this process. You know, once you understand the physical layer, how are there, um, how, what different ways do you have to um, attack and abuse it um, in, in an offensive capacity? So just some uh, thoughts I wanna, wanna leave you with. Um, is just to understand that, that these, these wireless systems are deterministic and can be understood and reverse engineered by applying this process. And I also want you to remember that um, as you're you know, moving forward, that physical layers are not magic. So um, you know, these things happen because engineers design them to work a certain way. And by better understanding how the physical layer works, you will write better software and build better, um, better applications for your users. Um, I also want to plug um, Software Defined Radio in general. It has uh, a wide range of applications, uh, including you know, security, which is um, you know, what's most interesting to me. Um, but SDR is useful to a range of users, and uh, consider you know, different ways in which you could integrate it with your workflow as you develop LoRa systems. So with that, I'm gonna you know, leave you with a challenge, and that's to uh, consider experimenting with software-defined radio technology. Um, you know, for 20 bucks on Amazon, um, you, you guys, is it, I, I'm from the US, is, is Amazon here in Europe, or? Okay. Um, so you know, for, for 20 US on, on Amazon, you can get yourself an RTL-SDR, which is perfect for LoRa. Um, it can tune to 433 and 868 and 915, so that's all you need to start, to start you know, looking at, at the spectrum and, and visualizing and playing with these chirps. Um, and if you don't want to spend the money on it, uh, GNU Radio is open source and free, and if you send me an email, I would be happy to send you some IQ captures so you can start experimenting with it yourself. Um, I just want to acknowledge quickly um, the Things Network um, uh, you know, core organizing group in the community. Um, I met Johan like two years ago um, at a LoRa event in, in San Jose. Uh, I told him that I was going to reverse engineer the physical layer, and he, I think, looked at me like I was crazy. Um, and uh, um, he and the rest of the group have been very um, you know, supportive and, and, um, 
uh, very supportive um, over the last two years as I've been working on this, and uh, I'm really uh, flattered to have been invited to come here and present. So thank you to, to them, and thank you to you all for coming. Um, the one last thing I want to say is, um, you know, telecommunications is a 150-year-old industry, and uh, I think uh, you know, it, it, efforts like this actually stand a chance of disrupting it. So, uh, you know, keep innovating, keep, uh, uh, keep persevering. I, I really like what Laura and the Things Network is about. So um, uh, thank you all for the work that you do. Uh, thanks for coming, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Matthew and I. Um, and I also especially liked, uh, I guess if I understood it correctly in the beginning of your talk, software-defined radio, you're not only used to break stuff, but also to make stuff that you can simulate hardware before you build it. And that's I right. think that's a very inno uh, innovative approach. Uh, Some more questions, comments? Yeah, over there. <laughs> Hello. Who are you? I'm Brian Smith from uh, TTN uh, Orlando. Hi. Uh, I appreciate your work on uh, GR Laura. I'm wondering, have you had any other contributions to it, and if we could use it to make a listen-only gateway that's super cheap with RTO SDR? For sure, that's a great question. So, um, I wrote a GNU radio module called GR Laura about a year ago, and have spent the last year thoroughly neglecting it. So um, uh, I, I need to get back and make some improvements to it. Right now, I don't think it would be very useful for many people in the room, but, um, but I would love to put some more time in and, um, and, and make it better. Um, certainly, it would have an interesting application that way. Um, I'm, I'm definitely you know, excited to put time in on my own. Um, and as always, pull requests are welcome. So yeah, here we go. Okay, thank you. Uh, some other questions. Ah, here at the front. Hello, who are you? Hi, I'm Tiago. Hi. I'd like to ask you if it's possible to store this raw data uh, before you process it. Like, for example, you have a radio and you want to store data for some time. <coughs> and, to, and you want, like, half a year later, oh, I have this raw data, can I process it again with a new methodology or with a new technique? Is that possible? Yeah, absolutely, and that's a great question. Um, so that's one of the things that SDR, you know, enables and really is, is, is you know, a lot of these workflows are built up to, to leverage. Um, you know, if you capture a signal and you don't necessarily know what it is, um, it's much easier to be able to play that back from a file deterministically than it is to have to go out and capture it in real time. Um, so yeah, you can definitely, um, you know, take your SDR driver and dump that right to a file and then play the file back in any point later. And just a quick anecdote I just want to share. Um, uh, so Thomas uh, Telkamp from uh, the Things Network, um, I'm sure most of you have seen, uh, he put uh, a LoRa radio on a satellite that's now, you know, you know, 600 kilometers away and is, you know, hurtling through space at, you know, 7,000 kilometers per second or something like that. Um, the the three dollar Semtech radios uh, can receive that, which is incredible. Um, but just before I, I came up here, I actually, you know, went outside with him and some others, and I borrowed one of his two meter antennas and used that SDR to capture a bunch of raw spectrum data. Um, so I'm going to take that home. And I'm going to work on decoding that. So while I make you know improvements and progress on GR Laura, that's going to be like the benchmark is to get it to the point where where it will be able to decode that. So that's that that workflow that you just described is something that um, that I and other you know researchers use all the time. So it's an analog sy uh, signal, but it's stored digitally as an image. So, yes, yeah, so the SDR um, samples the um, the analog you know RF spectrum uh, as it goes. So it, it it creates a digital representation of that that you can store on your disk. Okay. So finally, get your own software-defined radio and get working with Matthew Knight. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. <laughs>